All right, so let's look at the last section of chapter three. Um, it's more of a, oh, it's entropy, the entropy of mixing part on page. Um, page 78, so it's one of the examples. And we're going to see a little bit more of these later in the course towards the end. Um, but I think it's nice to have a preview uh, right now, uh, especially for those who are uh, interested in materials. And I know that I have at least one metallurgical engineer, so this is kind of cool. So in a random solid solution, you're going to have the sites of a lattice. Let's say that you have a solid and most solids are crystals. So uh, in three dimensions, they're gonna look kind of like a Rubik's cube, um, except that instead of having little cubes, you have an atom at each of the intersections. So in two dimensions, uh, it's gonna look like square lattice, for example, and you're gonna have the atoms over here. So there are different arrangements for the atoms. Uh, just a square or a, or a perfect cube is not very common. I think either polonium or radium uh, has that structure, but for the most part, they look like cubes, but with an atom in the middle or with atoms in the faces of the cubes. Uh, so a random solid solution, you have your, your lattice sites and you just throw the, the atoms randomly. So maybe you'll have an A atom over here, another one over here, maybe a B atom over here and over here, you know, A and A. So this will be a 50-50 random solid solution. We have three, oh, sorry, this will be 66, uh, 33. So you have four A atoms and two B atoms and so on, right? There's uh, um, a lot of materials that are, that are random solid solutions. The other possibility is that the atoms are arranged according to a certain pattern. For example, if you have an A here, you always have an, a B next to it, and then an A, and then a B over here. Um, we have a B over here, A, B, and so on, right? So this one will be completely ordered. And if the atoms, uh, if, if the positions of the atoms are assigned perfectly, then uh, the number of states available to the system is only one, right? If you determine one of the atoms, the rest of the crystal is determined. So if that is the case, what is its entropy? Oh, it's gonna be the natural log of one. What is the natural log of one? Okay, grab the calculator. Zero. Awesome. Hey, George. So if you have um, a different arrangement, so it's you have a little bit of disorder, then the entropy is going to be more than zero. All right. So if you have N minus T, A atoms, and T, B atoms. Then the number of states 
available to the system, which is a function of n, the total number of atoms, and t, the number of b atoms, is going to be n factorial divided by n minus t factorial times t factorial. So we do not have much time, so I'm not going to go through the algebra, but you can check my notes. So in order to get the entropy, we're going to take the uh, over here the natural log of the multiplicity. So you can use uh, Stirling's approximation, which says that n um, natural log of n factorial. Sorry. n natural log of n minus n. So by taking the natural log of this um, ratio and using Stirling's approximation, you end up with um, n natural log of n minus n minus t natural log of n minus t minus t natural log of t. And we can make a, a substitution. So let's call x the decomposition. So it's going to be T, the number of the atoms, divided by N, the number or the total number of atoms. So this is the percentage or the fraction of B atoms. And so the fraction of A atoms is going to be 1 minus X. Here's okay, so we get the two things. And in terms of the composition, The entropy is going to be minus n, the total number of atoms, 1 minus x, natural log of 1 minus x, plus x, natural log of x. And we will see this equation again uh, in, a, in a different application. So this is uh, the entropy uh, of bosons, which is one of the particles, one of the uh, kinds of things that exist in the universe, the other thing being uh, fermions. Okay, so the composition behaves like a, like a boson. Okay, so this is the entropy of mixing. So if you or if you just bring two solids together, not much is going to happen. But let's say that you melt them. So you have a melt of gold and a melt of nickel, for example, and you put them together. Uh, this is the, the change in the entropy once they solidify uh, of the system relative to the separate um, components or the separate elements. So entropy always wants to increase. So mixing two things together, uh, gold and nickel, for example, 
it is going to uh, increase the entropy. Does that mean? Professor? Yes. Does the energy play support right here? Because if you, like, if they com get combine the energy, the, in the energy that they share, there are more ways to combine the energy yep, as well. That's exactly when I, where I'm going. So oh, okay. the question that I was going to ask is, uh, if this means that uh, whenever you bring two elements together, they will want to combine. Can you answer that, Alejandro, in terms of the energy? Can you repeat the question again? And then if the entropy always increases when you mix two quantities, so they will want to be you know, in a disordered state, does that mean that all um, that all materials or system, all systems will want to combine? I mean, there are like I'm thinking about oil and water. They don't combine, right? Why? Um, I think because their molecular bonds are already full, something like that. Uh, yeah, I guess that would be the, the chemistry explanation. So that is correct. There are there are things that don't mix, even though the entropy will increase. So remember that what nature minimizes is the, the, the free energy, right? So this gives you the entropic component. Uh, so you're, you can get the entropy from over here. Uh, it is going to depend on the temperature and I'm going to talk a little bit about the temperature, but the other component is the energy. So in a, an easy fashion, if you have your A and B atoms, there is an energy between uh, A and A bonds or you know the bonding between a and b uh, a and a atoms b and b and a and b right in reality there's longer range and multi-body contributions but the simplest approximation there's a an energy between each pair of of particles and so if the energy of the average a and A and B and B bonds is lower than the average, well, than the energy between A and B atoms, then uh, the system minimizes its free energy by keeping as many as possible A and A and B and B bonds. And that will keep the, the substance um, segregated. So this will be the, the case of of water and oil. So even if the free energy can be minimized by increasing the disorder, the, uh, the entropy, the energy will increase. And so overall, uh, it's, not a good, it's not a good thing for, for oil and water. Uh, in, on the other hand, if the bonds between A and B atoms is lower, the energy is lower than the average of these ones, then uh, this substance will definitely mix. So it will, it will create a random solution. Um, so you mentioned water and oil. That is not a solution. How is that called? Um, I forgot how this thing is called. Um, it's essentially, they're not going to, to mix even if you can make the particles small enough, like, uh, like, like milk, for example. Um, so that would be the liquid case. Uh, you, you can also have a, so, a solution in the solid state. It's called, that's why it's called the solid solution. So the temperature also plays a role. So if you increase the temperature, even if the, if the entropy of mixing is the same, this term becomes more and more negative. And so this tells you that unless the substance uh, melts or does something like that, you know, becomes a, a, a gas, um, if that doesn't happen, there is some temperature at which the entropy 
is going to defeat the energy. So many substances, they segregate at lower temperatures, but if you increase the temperature, they will mix. If you don't destroy the substance, right? Like, uh, I think like oil particles in uh, are kind of sensitive to temperature. So they might cease to exist at like 100 Celsius or something. So yes, okay. So if you look at the shape of this equation, it looks like this. So this is X, the proportion of P atoms. It's going to be the entropy as a function of X. And going to look like that. So over here you have 50%, over here you have zero, and over here you have one. So if you have only B atoms or only A atoms, the entropy, configurational entropy is zero. Uh, if you have 0.5, you have the maximum entropy. And if you put the one half over there in the X, you will see that uh, this is going to be n, the number of atoms. But if we divide by n, the entropy per atom, that is going to be the natural law of two. Okay, so the entropy, the configuration, configurational entropy, is between natural log of one, which is zero, and natural log of two, which is 0.693. So I think that's a pretty cool result. Um, this is the the main motivation for a lot of the research that I that I do. So I want to know um, what causes substances to mix or not to mix. Uh, that changes its configurational entropy and changes something that we will see in a few weeks, which is called a phonon entropy. So when the molecules start, when the particles start vibrating. Okay. So there are, I'm gonna draw them over here. So there are three main situations. Um, as I mentioned, if the average, um, see that? No. If the average of the AA and BB bonds is much greater than the AB bonds, then you're going to get a phase diagram. So this will be the temperature. And this will be the composition that is going to look like this. And this is a common example, or well, I guess a common system, which has this behavior is uh, chrome, tungsten. So over here you have 100% tungsten and over here you have 100% chrome. Uh, in between you have chrome plus tungsten. They don't combine. They're going to form chunks of chrome, chunks of, of tungsten. Um, and then over here, Uh, in this part, you have, um, well, let's draw it like this. Over here, the temperature is high enough that you have a solid solution of chrome and tungsten. And over here, you have the liquid. So this is a segregating material. And this, called, this is called, a miscibility gap. You cannot 
mix the elements in this temperature and composition range. So if you have the other case, the energy of the AA and BB is much smaller than A and B. Mm. I think this is the this is a miscibility gap case with the which was much smaller. Sorry about that. So the other one in which this one is much smaller is going to form it's a different situation. An example of this one will be zirconium. Nickel. Over here, the atoms want to be ordered because this energy is smaller. And so this is just you know a mock diagram. But it may look something like that. So over here you have a particular composition, I don't know, say zirconium three nickel or zirconium nickel three. Um, over here you have zirconium three nickel and so on. So each one of these has a different um, structure and these do not form a random solution. So this is called uh, an ordering system. And the last case, these are approximately equal. And so the system doesn't have a strong preference for either segregation or ordering. And an example of this is uh, gold nickel. So at low temperatures, they're going to form solid solution. Through the whole composition range. And up here at this temperature is just the liquid. So there's not a, a strong preference for ordering or segregation, so they, you can arrange them uh, completely randomly. So those are the three cases. And so if you consider the dilute limit so x uh, goes to zero. So you know, let's say that you have uh, a, a substance that is mostly gold. Let's say that you're, you, you're purifying this, this alloy, um, you know, for whatever mean, which, uh, with whatever method. Um, I guess uh, uh, another good example will be uh, silicon. So you need very pure silicon to create, uh, to manufacture CPUs, right, computers. So they just grab sand and they melt it and then they start removing um, everything that is not silicon. And, you know, because of our demand for semiconductors, and silicon is the purest substance that we humans can create. So I think we can make it up to like one part in close to a billion, um, it's an impurity. So let's consider that limit, right? In which the number of atoms of the other substance goes to zero. In that situation, the entropy atom is going to be equal to negative one uh, natural log of one uh, plus 
x natural log of x. Yes, remember that this one was 1 minus x. So if x is very close to 0, then this is very close to 1. And this whole term then is 0. So then this is approximately equal to minus x natural log of x. Okay, so if we take the free energy, so if we take the derivative in order to get the free energy, so the, the derivative, negative derivative, with respect to the composition of x, natural log of x, and again, I'm not going to do the math here, but you can look at my notes. And it's going to be, um, on the, and you want this to be equal to zero because you want to know where the, the maximum or the minimum is. This is going to be um, one plus natural log of x. zero. So if you solve for x and move the one over here, negative one, and then take the exponent, you're going to get that the composition is e to the negative one, which is different than zero. So if you take the um, the derivative of the free energy with respect to the composition, you're going to end up with, you're going to have this term, and then the term from the energy is going to be this. Okay? So this is a cool term. And this equation and 3.86. So what this equation tells you is that nature precludes you, nature doesn't let you create a pure substance. The change in free energy by having just a little bit of, um, of impurity is way too big for, for nature not to do it. And this is kind of cool, you know, this is a completely entropic effect. You might change it, you might change the, um, this value by changing the temperature. Uh, but even if this term is equal to one, you still have this e to the negative one. So nature doesn't let you create perfection, which is kind of cool. All right, so let's start chapter four. Chapter four is thermal radiation. And the Planck distribution. Have you heard about these two things before? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. What is thermal radiation? What is
what is radiation waste are there? Is electromagnetic waves that come out of the body? Of a body? Yeah, that's uh of which body? I mean like uh I mean when I saw it, it was black body radiation, but it can like anybody radiates electromagnetic waves. So that's thermal radiation. Heat emissions. So there are two main things in the universe, arguably. Um, one of them is radiation. The second thing is matter. So radiation is um, one of the two main components. Uh, thermal radiation is radiation that is, uh, as um, George and Alejandro mentioned, uh, that is produced by uh, by 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 thermal um, motion, right? So a body that has a finite temperature will emit thermal radiation that includes people and the sun and pretty much everything. Uh, have you heard about the Planck distribution? You should have. Have you, well, I guess if you saw the the black body radiation, which looks a little bit like this, this, oh my goodness. Um, you know then something about the client distribution. Okay, so um, the Planck distribution describes the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum or energy spectrum of electromagnetic radiation and this the next part is really important in thermal equilibrium with a cavity and this radiation is uh, usually known as black body radiation. So we know that the sun is a emitter uh, that shows a spectrum that is similar to black body. How similar is it to a black body? George, how similar is the sun to a black body? It is a black body. It is almost a black body. So what is a black body? I'm going to draw it in a vertical way over here because of space. So it's like a perfect emitter and a perfect absorber of light? Mm. Yeah, it's hypothetical. Um, that definition is not completely correct, but it's not, it, it's close. So let me explain what it is. Over here, you have your reservoir. And over here, you have your system. And the system is in thermal equilibrium with the reservoir. So uh, this system is going to be made of, so I'm gonna draw them over here like dots. This is a, an ideal gas of photons. Okay, so last time we saw uh, a particle in a box, um, then many particles in a box, and there was the ideal gas. So there are different kinds of gases, and photons will form their own gas. 
uh, their own kind of gas. So this system is in thermal equilibrium with the reservoir. So if it could escape, if radiation could escape, then it will not be in thermal equilibrium with the reservoir because it will be losing particles. So a black body is called a black body because it doesn't emit any radiation. It cannot, it cannot emit radiation. If it does, then it will not be in thermal equilibrium. Why is the sun, which seems pretty bright from here, a black body? Well, it's because even though the sun is pretty humongous and lots of photons are escaping at any given time, the fraction of the photons that is escaping is minuscule. It's really tiny compared to the number of photons inside the sun. So to a very good degree, this approximation holds, right? Um, the sun is in thermal equilibrium. It's about like the particles are in thermal equilibrium. And most of them are inside. Some of them escape and allow us to observe the radiation. So once we analyze um, the spectrum, because so little of the radiation is escaping, uh, the spectrum tell us a lot about um, the state of equilibrium of the sun. And this is true even for our bodies, right? Uh, human bodies or animal bodies. Um, we are in thermal equilibrium. So, you know, our organs, uh, our bones, muscles, they are all pretty much at the same temperature. And um, there's radiation that is escaping, but it's, you know, it's not as, as tiny as the sun, but it's still pretty minor compared to the total radiation that we have in ourselves. And so we're also described approximately well, or uh, in an approximate way by this black body spectrum. Okay, so black bodies are kind of cool. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so photons are quantized. The energy difference between um, between states for photons is going to be uh, h omega. So it has to be an integer of h bar omega. Um, and this is equal to 2 pi h max um, Planck's constant and uh, frequency, right? So this is h bar and this is h. So the difference is you have the 2 pi over here, you have frequency over here, angular frequency over here. We're gonna be using this one, but they are the same. So photons have the property that they interact very, very, very rarely. Yeah, they do interact. Um, you can go to intergalactic space and you know, once every, I don't know, 10 million years or 100 million years, uh, you're going to have an interaction of photons. So they do interact, but um, for the most part, you, know, you can put as many as you want, as many photons as you want in the same state. And you know, for practical purposes, they are not going to interact. And that's one of the defining characteristics of the uh, ideal gas of photons. So you can put S photons in the same energy state. So the energy of that state is going to be S number of photons 
times the, times the energy of let's say h bar omega. So this is equation four point one. So um, I don't know if you already tried problem number three from the homework. If you have, then this is going to make this is going to click better. So uh, in that problem, it tells you that the energy of a quantum harmonic oscillator is also this. Have you seen it? Yes? So mathematically, quantum harmonic um, oscillator and uh, ideal photon gas are the same. So this is very interesting because the ideal photon gas is the first approximation to radiation, the first component um, of the universe. The quantum harmonic oscillator is a very good description of uh, solids, of matter. So it tells you that the other main component of the universe follows the same math even if, uh, if the interpretation is different. And so we're gonna look at the interpretation right now. But this is really cool. Keep it in mind. So in a... In a harmonic oscillator, you have your first energy state and it looks like that, right? So that will be h bar omega, say. Um, then the next one, it's gonna look like this. So it's gonna be, say, two h bar omega. And then the next one is gonna look like this. So it's gonna be three h bar omega, and so on. So this, harmonic oscillator is localized, it's somewhere. And it absorbs energy or emits energy if necessary, not by changing its position, but by increasing its frequency. So you add a quantum of energy um, and it increases the frequency by the, by the correct amount. So in a photon gas, the, the photons are not localized. They are kind of everywhere. So even though I have boundaries over here, you know, really they're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere in the box because they're just a wave. And let's say that you have your photon in the minimum energy state. So it looks like this. So over there is still H bar omega. When you add another photon, it can, it can be in the same state because they are not going to interact. So what's gonna happen is that the amplitude is going to increase. The frequency remains the same, the amplitude increases. By how much? Well, let's say that it moves to the next energy. So now you have two photons in the first energy state. And the next one is gonna do the same thing, and it just increases the amplitude. So it's gonna be three h bar omega. This is really cool. The math is exactly the same. 
the meaning, the physical meaning, or what they what the math represents is different. Okay, this arises from the fact that um, in the quantum harmonic oscillator, the energy states are separated by by integers, right? By um, single integers. So, okay, I, I keep saying this, but I think this is really cool. So let's get the Let's get the um, the partition function. Remember, if we have the partition function, we know everything about the system. Um, so in the in the book, it says that this derivation is for a gas of photons, but then it also mixes in some other words like phonons. So it's because uh, the math is the same. In the case of uh, radiation, we call it a photon. In the case of matter, we call it a phonon. And So on, I don't know how that catch on, but we have the electron, the proton, um, the photon, and here the root of phon comes from the Greek for sound, right? So a electron, a photon, a proton, they are, all of these things are quantized. Uh, a phonon is uh, what this word tries to mean is that it's a quantized wave of sound. And they're called like that because some of these waves uh, in solids are responsible for, they are sound waves. So they transmit sound. Is what we um, perceive as sound. So a phonon, it's a quantized wave traveling through the system. Um, we will see later that they are also uh, heat. This this is a quantized unit of heat. But for now, let's look at this partition function. So the partition function as a function of tau the temperature, this is just a definition, is the sum over all the states of the exponent of negative ES divided by tau. So in the particular case of the photon gas, this is gonna go from having zero photons to having um, an infinite number and the energy state is given by S H bar omega divided by tau. This is equation 4.2. So it represents the number of photons that are in the gas, right? The number of photons that are in a particular energy state. And then you sum everything. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right, so it's like it's like this over here. Yes. So I realized later that the book uses uh, the word, uh, the letter Y. Um, to represent H bar omega uh, over tau. Um, but I like beta, so I'm gonna use beta. Okay. So if you let beta be h bar omega over tau, then the partition function is the sum 
from s equals zero to infinity of e to the negative um, s beta. So I'm gonna put the next part over here. So professor, in, in this ideal uh, gas of potents, are we assuming that all the potents have the same frequency and we're just adding potents or something like that? Um, not quite. So what we are going to end up with uh, at the end is a function, a distribution in which over here you're gonna have h bar omega over tau. So this is the energy of the state. And over here you're gonna have uh, the number, let's say, we're gonna call it the expectation value of S. So how many photons do you have per energy? Right? So in our previous drawing, you're gonna have a lot of photons in the first state. You're going to have also a lot of photons, but, but less. in the next energy state. And then the next one, you're gonna have less than before. Maybe something like this. So this will be for a given frequency, you know, this is, um, well, I don't know what the frequency will be. You have the, you need the integers over here, but um, as you increase the number of periods that you have, you increase the frequency, right? So this is going to give you how many photons you have per frequency. I see, I see. So we're going to see that in a little bit. Let me, let me move uh, over here. I have to move a little fast. So check this out. You can use it in your homework. The partition function is e to the zero. So the first one is zero over there. And then e to the negative beta, so it will be one, uh, plus e to the negative two beta, plus you know the rest. So this is equal to one, the e to the zero. So we can put a one over there. And this one, we can move it over here. So Z minus one equals this, this series. So Z times E to the negative beta is gonna be, um, you had a one initially, so you multiply that times E to the negative beta. So you get E to the negative beta in the next term, you had uh, e to the minus beta. So now you have e to the minus two beta and so on, right? And so if these two quantities are equal to each other, then these two quantities are equal. So uh, z minus one is equal to z e to the negative beta. Okay, and so mm, mm, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to move the So negative z over here, that's equal to negative one. And 
and then we can factorize the z over here. So it's going to be e to the negative beta minus one equals negative one. And so z, the partition function, is negative. Mm, we can put the negative over here. So this will be negative and this will be positive. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So then this is um, this is positive. This is one over uh, one minus e to the negative beta. And if we rewrite the beta as h bar omega over tau, then we get that the partition function is uh, 1 minus exponent of minus h bar omega tau, 1 over that. Okay, so that is equation uh, 4.3. This is the partition function of either the photon gas, uh, ideal gas, or the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, so now we get we can get the probability. So the probability of having state S is gonna be the uh, exponent of negative S H bar omega over tau. This is the Boltzmann factor divided by the partition function. So this is one of the definitions from the previous chapter. Uh, this is equation 4.4. So now we can take the thermal average. I'm going to put it over here. The thermal average. Well, any more space? Yes. It's going to be the sum over all the states of S times the probability distribution of S. And, oops. Okay, my computer is gonna die. All right, guys, I'm gonna, I have to, I didn't bring the charger, so I have to end the class over here. Um, I'm going to record another uh, 15 minutes when I get home with the, uh, the derivation, okay? So I'm going to derive the Planck distribution, which is equation 4.6. So please check it out, okay? Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Oh, well, that was stupid.